Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our first webinar of the 2019-2020 ECRC webinar series. Does your feed pass a test? Making sense of feed test results. I'm Ellen Crane, the Extension Coordinator with ECRC, and I will be your moderator for tonight. This session will last approximately one hour, but may go longer depending on the number of questions you've got for us on during the question and answer period. If you're on Twitter, tweet along with us tonight using the hashtag beefwebinar. We are recording this session and I will email out the link to the recording to everyone that registered in a couple of days. So if you miss hearing anything tonight and want to watch it again later, you can. Of course, you'll be able to hear and see tonight's presenters, but we can't hear or see you. If you want to communicate with us, type into the small chat window in the control panel near the bottom or at the top of your screen. If you have a question or comment for me or either of the presenters, that's the place you can enter that and feel free to send questions in at any time. We'll answer them all near the end of the hour. If your internet connection is a bit slow, it might help to close other programs that are using the internet as well as close your webcam window, which means you won't be able to see us, but hopefully the audio will come through clear so that you can hear us. Um, and you get the slides to load a bit faster for you. Okay, let's get started. This is what we will be covering tonight. You're going to hear from two speakers on the webinar this evening. They will be speaking about fee testing and then we will be opening it up for some Q&A. With that, let's get started. I am pleased to welcome our speakers for tonight, Karen Schmidt. Karen grew up on a mixed farm near Kioma, Alberta. Sorry, Karen, I butchered that. Uh, raising purebreds and tall cattle and grain and is still involved in family operation. Uh, she has a master's degree in agriculture from the University of Alberta and her thesis focused on the genetic and metabolic factors affecting feed efficiency in beef cattle. Before joining ABP, Karen spent over four years with the Canadian Hereford Association as the redevelopment coordinator. At ABP, Karen is the research and production manager, providing technical support in the areas of cattle health and welfare, research and production practices. She works very closely with a number of industry and government organizations on issues of importance to the industry, and a large part of her job is translating science to producers and explaining producer needs to researchers. Also tonight, we have Megan Van Shake. Megan is the cattle, beef cattle specialist for the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, also known as OMAFRA, working out of Guelph. Prior to working in her current position, Megan worked in the feed industry for a number of years and then in meat inspection. Megan graduated from the University of Guelph with a BSc in Agriculture, majoring in Animal Science and an MSc in Ruminant Nutrition, and she also received her BED from Queen's University. Tonight, Karen and Megan will be speaking about feed testing and stretching feed supplies. And with that, I'll hand it over to Karen first. Thanks, Ellen. Let's see. I'll share my screen here. Hopefully everyone can see that. We'll be talking about uh, finessing feed testing with Karen and Megan. Um, so we'll start off with the easy question is, is why feed test at all? And really here our goal is to ensure that our animal requirements are met from a nutritional standpoint. So can you determine the quality of this hay bale by just looking at it? And that's a poll question. I'll launch that here in one second. There you go. Okay, we'll give it another second here. Okay, so 77% say, oops, say no, that you can't tell the quality of this bale just by looking at it. All right. So, 
70% of you were correct. No, you can't tell the quality of this bale just by looking at it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation here today. And time for another poll question. Okay. Okay, so do you test your feed once a year after harvest, whenever a new feed source is being used, whenever my nutritionist, the slash feed consultant tells me to, routinely multiple times a year, or I don't usually test my feed. Okay, another second. Okay, 32% uh, say once a year after harvest, and another equal 32% say whenever a new feed source is being used. Uh, third place, 20% says I don't usually feed test. Excellent, and time for one more. This is very interactive. <laughs> Okay, third question. If you don't usually test your feed, why not? Uh, so cattle appear healthy, it's too expensive, not sure how to collect samples or where to send them. Uh, I rely on feed test results from the feed supplier or rely on other indicators such as body condition, manure consistency, seasonal growing conditions, etc. Okay, just another second. Okay, so 36% rely on other indicators such as body condition, nerve consistency, and seasonal growing conditions. Uh, second place, 27% not sure how to collect samples or where to send them. And a close third place is that it's too expensive. Those are interesting. Um, that came out differently than I expected. So some surveys that have been done. Um, this is the Western Canadian Cow-Calf Survey in 2017. It said 38% lab tests for feed quality annually, which is actually down from 47% 47 in 2014. And this matches up pretty closely with what you guys said on the poll. 24% uh, test occasionally. Now in Ontario, um, the cow-calf production survey in 2017 showed 66% do not lab test feed for quality at all, 21% annually, and then 13% test occasionally. So those matched up really, really well with what you guys said on the poll. Of those who don't regularly test, this is where things get a little bit interesting. 61% in the Western Canadian cow-calf survey said that cattle appear to be healthy, so they don't need to test. 16.5% rely on other indicators. Um, in the poll you guys just took, that was a 36%. Other indicators like body condition, manure consistency, or seasonal growing conditions. 9% rely on results from feed supplier, and 8% found it too expensive. And 6% weren't sure how to collect a sample. And, and here in this poll that you guys just took, 27% uh, say they weren't sure how to collect a sample. And boy, do we have good news for you because Megan's gonna cover all sorts of that. Um, I just wanna go back to a second for, for this cattle appear to be healthy because I hear that a lot. And I'd like to just digress for a moment and tell you guys a little bit of a story. So a few years ago, there was a guy and he never tested any of his feed. He fed a lot of green feed. 
uh, which had always worked out for him in the past. Um, there was no loss of body condition score, but this particular year, what he found was that he'd have cows that, generally older cows, that were pretty close to calving, and they'd go down and die within a matter of hours. And there was no indication prior to that that anything was wrong. And what it actually turned out to be was winter tetany, which is a, an imbalance in calcium and magnesium and potassium that, or phosphorus, sorry, calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus that uh, really wreaks havoc on, on the metabolic processes. And, and the culprit was his green feed. So you can't always tell that cattle are healthy um, with their nutrition just by looking at them. So again, why feed test? Because you can't manage what you don't measure. So we can avoid some sneaky production problems. And, and with that, I'm thinking, you know, maybe your average daily gains aren't quite as high as you think they should be. Maybe your open rates are a little higher than they should be. The first place you should always look is your nutrition program for those types of things before you start thinking in an animal disease issue or something, a reproductive issue. Um, the nutrition program is almost always the culprit when, when things just aren't quite right. We can prevent or identify nutritional deficiencies or toxicities, identify nutritional gaps for supplementation programs. We can develop complete rations, which should be a, a goal for everyone. We can look at opportunities for alternative feedstuffs, things like byproducts, things like distillers grains or corn stover. We can price feed for buying or selling. And probably most importantly, we can really economize our feeding programs. And I just wanna take a second to talk about that because we have to use the information from the feed test. It's not enough just to get a feed test and stick it in a drawer. We actually have to look at that information and do something with it. So 70 to 75% of annual feed costs are winter feeding. And every dollar reduction in feed costs is almost $2.50 profitability improvement. So that's a pretty good return on investment. And if we're really balancing our rations properly, we can save anywhere from $50 to $150 in feed costs per cow per winter. And that's a big, big deal when margins are tight. So if we have 10 open cows, for example, the salvage value on those cows is just over $11,000, but we have 10 fewer calves, so we've lost $12,000 of revenue because those cows didn't have calves. We need to find 10 new replacement heifers and develop those heifers into bred cows that will hopefully have a calf at a cost of about $20,000. And overall, we're looking at a net loss here of almost $21,000 on those 10 cows. So if we can refine our nutrient program and our nutrition program enough so we're really reducing those open rates, it can have a big impact on your bottom line. And now it's Megan's turn. So I'll stop sharing here, if I can figure out how to make that happen. There we go. Can everybody um, hear me, see me, and see the slides? Yep. Can you just put a, yourself in a presentation mode? There we go. Okay. Super. Uh, hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Megan Van Cheek. I'm working for OMAFRA out of Guelph. I'm a beef cattle specialist, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Karen mentioned, um, I'm going to be taking you through some 
um, uh, sampling methods um, so that you are getting the best results out of your feed tests. Um, you're going to be noticing that there are some common threads throughout these sampling methods. So I've kind of summarized this here with some guiding principles for um, sample collection. Um, there are some nuances between um, different feed sources that um, we're going to go through over the next couple of slides here. Um, but, the, but the main idea is that um, we want to understand the nutritional value of all feedstuffs being fed. So that means that you want to um, sample and test all feed sources, um, feedstuffs on, on uh, your farm. A major source in error in analysis is, um, is due to sampling error. So um, to get the most bang for your buck and the most accurate results for your feed test, um, it's really critical to take representative samples. Um, so that involves taking um, a number of subsamples from um, a lot of feed um, to make a composite sample. So that means you mix up those uh, subsamples and then send that representative composite sample away to the lab for testing. Um, in order to take those subsamples, we need to use um, proper sampling tools that will give us um, accuracy um, and best representation in those subsamples. Um, so these tools can include um, on the top there, um, that's a forage probe um, that can be used, um, uh, that should be used for sampling forages. Um, and then on the bottom there, that's a grain probe for sampling um, uh, grains and commodities. Um, and the other um, key thing to remember through, throughout your sampling um, is to um, embrace this concept of uh, sampling by lot um, because there can be qu um, quite a bit of variability across cuts, uh, fields, and storage methods. So uh, we want to reduce that um, variability by um, sending away separate samples from um, different cuts, uh, fields, or farms, and storage methods to the lab. Another key concept is maintaining sample integrity. So after you take that composite sample, uh, we want to make sure that um, it's stored properly and proper storage can lead to, um, to spoilage and um, respiration and that can um, ultimately skew, skew your results from your feed test. And then understanding what you need to know by f before sending the sample away for analysis um, is really key. So selecting the proper an analysis package um, uh, to get what you need out of your feed test is important. Okay, so just going through here um, a couple of um, different feed steps and what we have to think of, um, consider when we're sampling. Um, so with failed forage, again, we want to take um, multiple subsamples. Um, so um, we're looking at about 20 bales to sample from. Uh, we want to take one core sample um, per bale using a forage sample probe. Um, we want to make sure that it's sharp. Um, and um, so this is to ensure that it cuts through um, the bale um, rather than pushing apart stems and leaves, etc. The goal with our sample collection is that we want to get representative leaf to stem ratio. Um, we also want to get um, proper re representation of um, different plant species in your hay. Um, so the idea is that we take the samples um, using the probe at right angles. So for small square bales, um, that's at the end of the bale. Um, for big squares, that can be either at the end um, at a 90 degree angle or on the sides at a 45 degree angle. Um, for round bales, um, similarly, uh, we want to take the sample at right angles to the circumference of the bale. Um, so that's illustrated in that picture there. Um, again, we need to test each lot separately to reduce variability. So um, sometimes the labs will report that they get a, a bag of subsamples and they're coming from different cuts. Um, different farms and fields or different maturity levels um, and this can create a lot of variation in your sample. So um, test each lot, each lot separately for, for best results. Um, you can also um, use this information from separate lots to um, feed out strategically as well um, depending on cattle class. So, um, so once you have those subsamples, the idea is to mix those cores in a clean pail um, and, then, and then send away about 200 to 500 grams um, to the lab. Okay, 
<clears throat> excuse me, with uh, silage, same idea. We want to take um, multiple grab samples um, for, um, from different locations. So I tried to avoid the face of, um, I can't, oops, sorry. It can be dangerous around the, the uh, face of the bunk. So the idea is to unload a pile from either a tower silo or a bunker silo um, and select some grab samples from different locations in the pile. We want about, uh, yeah, about 10 to 20 grab samples. Um, those subsamples should be collected in a clean pail and mixed thoroughly to make a composite sample. Um, and then the other thing is that we want to be um, making sure that we are collecting fresh uh, feeds. So, um, that there's no spoilage or heating um, in the silage. Taking a sample from pasture, similar concept, um, we want to take multiple subsamples. So we want to select from about 20 different sites on pasture. Um, and, and the key here is to make sure that we're taking samples from where cattle are actually grazing um, and at their grazing height. So the idea is to clip um, handfuls of forage at grazing height. Um, you want to avoid soil contamination because that can affect the um, mineral results, um, particularly um, in your um, in your sample results. Use a clean bucket to collect samples um, and thoroughly mix these subsamples to take a composite sample. It's a good idea to, to cut the forage samples into smaller pieces before mixing. That will give you a more uniform sample in the end. And then uh, another key um, point here is to freeze this um, composite sample prior to sending away to the lab. Um, and this is to prevent um, further res respiration. Okay, so swath grazing is um, a practice that's adopted particularly in Western Canada. Um, same thing here that we want to take um, subsamples from multiple multiple locations throughout the field. So um, we're looking at selecting three to five plants from the middle of the windrow. Um, and we want to get a good representation of, of the plants that are in that stand. Um, so you'll repeat that for 20 locations throughout the field, again, where the cattle are grazing, and um, send these plants in for analysis in a composite form. Similar concept here, again, for grazing corn and res or corn residue. Um, what you're looking at doing here is um, taking whole plant samples where cattle are grazing. Um, the quality will vary in different parts of the plant, which is why you want to take a sample of the whole plant. Um, so take samples from about eight to ten plants, chop these, um, uh, make a composite, and submit the subsample. Okay, if you are feeding any grains or um, processed feeds, um, uh, commodities on your um, to your cattle, um, it's um, uh, important to use a grain probe to obtain a rep representative sample. Um, in some cases, bulk commodities for bulk commodities, a, a certificate of analysis is provided, um, and that can be um, telling, give you some information on the nutritional composition of your feed. Um, likewise, a guaranteed analysis on any uh, manufactured supplements um, can also give you some insight into the nutritional composition of that feed. Okay, some quick do's and don'ts um, for sample collections, just as a reminder, um, and this will help build, um, again, maintain the um, integrity of your sample all the way to the lab. So um, again, can't stress enough that it's important to take a representative sample. Again, this involves taking subsamples from a particular lot um, and using proper um, sampling tools. Another um, critical aspect here is properly labeling the sample bags. Um, so that includes the um, uh, your name, um, the date that the crop was harvested, the date the sample was collected, um, and information on, this, on the type of sample. Um, and, and then also maintain any other records that should go along um, with that particular sample. And some kind of identification code for for, for the sample that you can um, relate to on the submission form. Um, seems obvious, but um, it's a necessary step to complete a submission form. Um, so that should include all of your key contact information, um, include 
a description of all of the samples that you're submitting on the form um, and also details on the um, lab analyses that you're collecting um, so the lab knows what tests to run. Okay, removing oxygen left in the bag. This is important again to um, reduce spoilage and respiration um, and also to uh, maintain this, the integrity of the sample. Again, uh, proper storing, properly storing the sample um, is um, important. So um, high moisture samples um, and pasture clippings should be frozen before su um, submitting to the lab. Um, and all samples need to be protected from uh, heat and direct sunlight. Some don'ts for sample collection. Um, don't send a sample away on a Friday because the sample will probably end up staying on a truck over the weekend. Uh, make sure that again, there's no um, contaminants in your sample for um, accurate results. Uh, don't submit a sample that's too large. It makes it difficult for the lab to handle. Um, and then try to avoid dividing a composite sample further because it could, um, it could uh, mess up the, uh, the leaf to stem ratio in your um, forage um, sample. Okay, just some key notes on filling out a submission form. Um, your submission form can be obtained either directly from the lab that you're submitting to, um, or um, it can be obtained from your feed representative. Again, complete all your contact information um, so that you can get your results um, and um, the lab knows where to send them to. Ensure that all of your samples are listed, again, just to reduce any confusion at the lab. Okay, and select your package for analysis. So identifying what um, you want to test for, and this will be um, dependent on the type of cattle that you're feeding, uh, the class of, of cattle that you're feeding, um, and whether it's proactive and, uh, versus reactive testing. So are you testing proactively to get a sense of the nutritional value of your feed or identify any issues with toxins or reactive testing um, if you are reacting to a problem? Um, there are NIR and wet chem packages available and we'll go through those in just a minute. Um, and you can select either a package, which you usually get your most bang for your buck, or you can um, also identify some individual analyses. Okay. So selecting an analysis package, um, a typical proximate analysis will tell you um, most of what you need to inform your feeding program. Um, so uh, most proximate packages will include moisture, crude protein, um, energy, um, uh, fiber. Um, ash can also be another indicator of quality, um, so it can help you um, understand if there's significant soil contamination in your forages. Um, and then you want to be, um, uh, you, you'll also want to run a mineral analysis to help you identify any um, mineral deficiencies in your feedstuffs. So um, commonly you'll test for some of those macros, so calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. Um, but you may also um, want to consider additional analyses for minerals, so um, trace minerals such as copper, manganese, manganese and zinc are all important to reproduction and growth um, and are quite often deficient. So, um, and then selenium tends to be deficient across um, our soils in Canada. Um, cobalt, cobalt and iodine um, also um, deficient in some areas of Canada. Additional analyses um, that are typically add-on packages include mycotoxins and ergot is, um, ergot is usually an issue that, um, is, that you deal with in Western Canada. Um, nitrates, um, so nitrates can occur in annual crops um, under certain growing conditions um, such as drought, after drought, hail, frost, um, anything that can cause stress on the plant. Um, so a quick test can help you determine um, whether um, there are um, increased levels of nitrates. A pH um, test for silages um, can help you assess how effective fermentation has occurred. Um, sulfur is another test that's um, uh, that's um, 
um, good to test for if there are high concentrations of uh, distillers or if you have brassicas in the mix. Um, the concern with sulfur is that it increases high levels can or high concentrations can increase risk of polio. Um, acid detergent in, insoluble nitrogen or acid detergent insoluble um, uh, protein uh, will tell you if heat damage um, is suspected um, due to improper ensiling um, and sugars and starch are also another option for add-on packages. Okay, so NIR versus wet chemistry. So this is, um, these are um, different packages that are offered through labs. So NIR stands for near infrared reflectance spectroscopy. And uh, basically this, this analysis uses different wavelengths of light to identify um, nutrients in a sample. Um, so um, it tends to be more economical than wet chemistry packages, fast turnaround time, um, the accuracy of this test, uh, this type of testing depends on the test and the ingredient. It's not available for all analyses um, and it's not available for novel ingredients. Um, wet chem is a traditional um, um, approach to analysis. Um, it's available for all ingredients and analyses. Um, it's widely available across labs. Um, it, it is um, a more accurate method for mineral testing, but it does tend to be more expensive. Okay, and now I'm gonna hand it back over to Karen. Thanks, Megan. All right, so now we've got results. What do we do with them? And usually you'll get a, a sheet of paper and it's got all these numbers on it. You know, you've got your moisture, you've got your dry matter, you've got your protein, all of those things. But are these results good, bad, or indifferent? And, and how do you know that? And really, <laughs> the answer is it kind of depends, right? What class of cattle are you feeding? What stage of production are they at? Is this feed going to be fed standalone or mixed with other feeds? Um, because that will change the quality of the, of the ration, right? Um, so we want to use these results that we get from the feed tests to balance the ration to make sure we're meeting all those nutritional requirements. We want to identify some potential toxin, toxins or deficiencies. We can compare value of feeds for sale or purchase um, and we can determine impacts of storage. And this becomes important when you have some carryover, if you're looking at feeding some older feed that's been stored for a while, because the quality will change over time. And, and while we're talking about quality changing, it's important to realize that just because you've uh, sampled a, a certain field in the past, the quality is not going to be the same year over year or even from a part of a field to a different part of the field. And that's because environmental conditions have a huge effect on what your quality ends up looking like. So here's time for another poll. I love the interactive stuff. <laughs> I'll get that geared up here. Okay, what do you do with your feed test results? Do you get input from nutritionists slash feed consultants slash extension specialists? file it or balance my own rations? Okay, just another second there. Okay, so about 51% say they get input from a nutritionist. 39% uh, say balance my own rations and 10% say file it. Mm, excellent. Um, very similar to what the Western Canadian Cow-Calf Survey found, um, just over 50% were using the results to balance the ration with a, a nutritionist or an extension specialist of, of some kind. 
while 44% were balancing on their own. Uh, similar in Ontario, 48% were balancing rations with a nutritionist, 31% were balancing on their own. So I want to just talk a bit about a new tool that's available on beefresearch.ca slash feed testing, or you can just search feed testing on the BCRC website. Uh, this, this tool was developed um, with nutritionists and through the Alberta Beef Forage and Grazing Center. Uh, we used some rules of thumb to basically create a report card for feed test results. So a couple of things this tool will not do it will not balance a ration. It will not formulate a re least cost ration. This is really just a quick and easy look at whether or not a single feed is going to be appropriate for, for cattle in terms of meeting their nutritional requirements. So I'm just gonna share a few screenshots here of, of what the tool looks like. And so the first thing you can do is up here, you can select your cattle class. Right here, I've got it as mature cows but you can also choose um, heifers, replacement heifers, or backgrounders, or bulls. Then you go and you select your stage of production. Here I've chosen late gestation. Other options are early and mid gestation and lactation, um, maintenance for bulls, and average daily gain for the backgrounders. Then you go in and you enter your weight in this column, and that's just basically to make sure that, that you, you realize that heavier animals will consume a bit more feed. Then you take some of the key things from your feed test results, hit calculate single feed data, and I've used actual feed test results here to calculate out what this would look like. Now, as with most things, green is good, red is bad, and yellow is something you kind of have to watch. So here in this particular uh, feed test result, we've got, some, we've got great energy for these cows and legs gestation, but we're low on protein, we're low on calcium, we're low on phosphorus and low on magnesium. So this basically tells you to take a look at that and you have to take the next steps to consult with a nutritionist or use a program like Cow Bites to figure out what you need to add to that ration to make sure that all, all the boxes are green. What I've done here is simply change uh, late gestation to early gestation. And what we can see is now our crude protein is green. So we're, so we're good for protein for this class of cattle, but we're still low in some of those minerals. And, and basically what this tells you is that, you know, if you've got a feed stuff that isn't appropriate for, for one class of cattle, that you can maybe use it in another class of cattle and come out all right. This next one is just showing, uh, I've changed the class to mature bulls and the stage of production to maintenance. Um, here we've got some yellow boxes showing up here. Um, that just means keep an eye on it. It's probably okay because we did build some, some reasonable margins of error into the tool, but you just want to keep an eye on, on how the cattle are doing there in terms of energy and the magnesium level. But, but the interesting thing to watch here is that calcium to phosphorus ratio is really high and, and that can cause some significant metabolic issues. The other thing this tool will do is if you're feeding something like here, this happens to be a feed test result for straw, and the TDN, the energy, is very, very low. And then you'll get a pop-up at the bottom that basically says it's not suitable to be fed by itself for any class of cattle. So in this case, everyone I think knows that maybe you shouldn't feed cattle an all-straw diet without any sort of supplementation, but this just really brings it home that something is very, very wrong here. And if, if you try to do that, bad, bad things will happen. So if we're taking our feed testing to the next level, and Megan touched on, a, on some of this with the other analysis packages that are available, but we can look at things like acid detergent fiber and neutral detergent fiber. This is really a measure of the digestibility of the feed, which will then influence dry matter intake. We might be wanting to look at other trace minerals such as copper, manganese, or zinc. Copper tends to be quite deficient across Canada and can uh, impact reproduction quite a bit. So we want to we want to keep an eye on our copper. Um, as Megan said, a lot of our soils are selenium deficient, but it is expensive to test for. So just keep that in mind. 
Um, according to Barry Remsio at uh, Alberta Agriculture, um, there's really no point in testing for cobalt and iodine. We just need to supplement those to 100% of requirements. And our vitamins, uh, especially vitamin A, D, and E, will degrade over time. And there's only so much time that those vitamins will be stored in the liver, especially vitamin A. So we need to supplement those, especially if we're feeding older, older feedstuffs that have been out in the elements. We want to think about the mycotoxins, like Megan mentioned, um, especially in Western Canada, we want to be thinking about ergot if that's a problem in a particular year. Our nitrates, this is especially bad if we're looking at cutting or grazing it within two weeks after frost or hail damage. That's when, that's when the nitrates will really pop up. And our sulfates, especially if there are known issues. So if you happen to test your water, which is a potential good thing to do if you're looking at some uh, antagonisms with, with your water quality and what you've got in your feed. If you have high sulfur water and high sulfur feed, you're going to be looking at health issues in the form of polio. Uh, brassicas tend to be high in sulfur as well as canola if you're feeling any canola stubble or uh, canola byproducts. And then again, as Megan mentioned, pH for silage to make sure that everything's correctly fermented. Now you may want to think about feed testing more than once in a particular season and when this will be an issue is if you're feeding old hay. So if you're lucky enough to have carryover and you've been storing it for a year or two, you might want to test that again because quality will change with that storage time. As well, if you're buying in hay and it doesn't come with a feed test, I, I would think you would be hedging your bets uh, fairly well to, to test that bought in hay. If your forage has been outside and had some weathering, um, if it would, had been rained on uh, before you baled it and you sampled it before you baled it, um, you might want to do it again afterwards. Ideally, you're sampling um, as close to feeding as, as possible, but that's not always uh, entirely practical. So if it's, if it's experienced a lot of weathering, just maybe run it through again. If you're noticing some performance issues with your cattle and things just aren't seeming quite right, you may want to just see if anything has changed in, in those uh, feed test results since the last time. And we wanna keep in mind that forage digestibility changes over time. And, and like I mentioned before, it changes from year to year to year uh, in terms of quality, even if you're using the same fields for hay production as an example. And results from a forage analysis from pasture or swath grazing is a snapshot in time. So uh, that quality will change throughout the season. And this is another tool that's available on the BCRC webpage, uh, feedtesting.ca, or beefresearch.ca slash feedtesting. Sorry, I needed to have that written up there for me clearly. Um, what this does is this is not actual feed costs. So let's just be clear, this is a relative feed cost and it's a relative feed cost based on energy and protein content. So what you can do here is you can enter some reference feeds. Here I am pretending I have some barley grain and some canola meal already on hand for whatever reason. Um, I've entered in the energy and the protein content of that as well as the dry matter and the price. I'm looking to buy some hay and here's the hay that, that people are offering for sale as well as its dry matter, its energy and its protein. And what we really want to look at is this last column where it says positive or negative. And what it's doing is basically weighting the feeds on their protein and energy content compared to the reference feeds you entered at the beginning. So again, if we've got a positive here, we're looking at this is a good deal. So the higher number when it says positive, the better deal it is for you. So this hay at a, at a $125 per ton as fed, even though the quality is a little poor, the, the offset is that it is um, going to be a good deal to buy in. Whereas um, this hay at the bottom is not going to be a good deal. You should use the, what you already have on hand. So that's another thing you can play with on the BCRC site to help you make some purchasing decisions. 
Now we're going to shift gears just a little bit and do a bit of a feed outlook uh, coast to coast. Um, I apologize to our friends in BC, but we have some, some data gaps out that way. Um, BC ministry doesn't put out crop reports as, as we get in the prairies. Um, but we know that the northern part of BC was quite dry, especially early on in, the, in this growing season. They have ongoing wildlife concerns where they are constantly battling damage to their feed supplies from, from wildlife. And a large part of the province is still going through some, some fire recovery me measures from, from fires last year and especially the year before. So this is a, a map from Agriculture Canada just showing the percent of average precipitation. Um, and, and again, you can see the coverage is, is quite poor across BC, but it looks like most of the province is, is kind of in that slightly below to slightly above normal range. In Alberta, this is as of last week, uh, we have 74% of harvest complete, but our 10 year average is 86%, so we're behind. Um, it varies from 90% done in the south to only 53% done in the Peace region. We've got some lodging, we've had some frost damage. Um, the interesting thing here is that only between 11% and 49% of our barley is currently grading malt, which means that there should be a, a reasonable supply of feed barley out there. As far as pasture ratings go right now, um, not great, 23% uh, poor, 39% fair, 36% good, and 2% excellent. Um, we're coming off of a couple of years, especially in the southern and eastern parts of the province that have been dry. As you can see from this map, we've recovered slightly. Uh, this is the growing season where we've had some, some flooding actually in the northwest and northeastern parts of the province, but the southern part is really, really dry. And our pastures have been hit hard over the last couple of years and there's been a lot of overgrazing just because feed supplies have been short and pasture growth hasn't has been worse than expected. So we'll be looking for some some really good spring moisture and some some good growing days early in the spring to hopefully recover some of those those pastures. In Saskatchewan, uh, still as of last week, they're about 83% done, uh, again behind, about 10% behind the 10-year average, ranging from 94% in the northern eastern part of the province to 66% in east central Saskatchewan. They've also had lots of lodging, frost, some wildlife damage, and, and a lot of pre-sprouting, so they're seeing their barley sprouting or their wheat sprouting early. And here I'm just looking at a comparison between the hay and pasture moisture conditions. The map at the top here is as of June, and you can see how dry all of Saskatchewan was in June. Um, this is as of last week, and we see some topsoil moisture recovery. But again, a lot of these pastures have been hit really, really hard over the past couple of years. In Manitoba, um, they're about 70% 77% done, sorry. Uh, again, about 10% behind the three-year average. 90% in central Manitoba to 65% in the southwestern part of the province. They've had heavy snow, flooding, they've had issues with nitrates, and feed shortages are expected in Manitoba. Uh, one report I read said that actually they're forecasting an extra month of feeding. Um, some cows are already on what we would call winter feeding programs simply because they can't get to, to feed for them and a lot of the feed's been ruined. Um, so here we're looking at percent of normal precipitation throughout the growing season and the bulk of Manitoba has been very, very wet and experienced uh, some, some really nasty uh, over moisture conditions. And now I'll change it back to Megan to do the eastern part of the province. Um, how do I do that? Like this. Stop share. Uh, Megan, are you able to share?
Okay, I think we may have having some technical difficulties. Um, but while we're waiting for Megan to come back here, um, Karen, maybe you can answer a question or two. Uh, I can try. <laughs> uh, let's try this one. Um, if you're blending all of your feeds together, so let's say you're going to feed through TMR or something like that, is it necessary to separate the sample, for example, first, second cut hay and straw? So dividing it into the ingredients to test it, or can you test it as the whole mixture? If you're gonna be feeding something like a TMR or, or dumping a bunch of, of feed ingredients into a mixer, um, I would mix those all together and send that as, a, as the sample because that's going to comprise what you're actually feeding. Um, hopefully Megan agrees with me now that she's back. Sorry, I didn't catch the beginning of that. So the question was about if you are going to be feeding uh, a bunch of separate ingredients together, like in a TMR or in a mixer, um, mm -hmm. do you need to separate them out and get feed test results on those all separate or can you test them together? I lean towards testing them together. Yeah, so I guess it, it, it depends on, um, on what, what you're doing. So um, if you're building a ration, if you're looking at building a ration and formulating a ration, you want to test all of your um, forages and feed ingredients separately to help inform that ration formulation um, to verify that you are um, indeed feeding um, what your ration is calling for. Um, in terms of nutrients and proportions, that's when you can take a feed sample to um, verify that you are um, meeting the nutrient requirements that you've set out or nutrient specs that you've set out for your ration. Perfect. All right, Megan, can you share your slides and we'll carry on from... Sure. Please. I apologize for that. I was having some connection issues here, so... No problem. Just go into presentation mode when you're ready. Okay, so can you see that now, Ellen? Looks good. Super. Apologies again for that. So um, the next kind of couple of slides that I'm going to um, the walk through is just a bit of a snapshot in terms of um, what the growing season um, was like in Ontario and parts of Eastern Canada. So this is a bit of a snapshot from um, Ontario. It was a very wet spring. It resulted in um, delayed planting in, in many areas across Ontario. Um, sorry. Um, and through the summer, so things dried up in the summer, um, particularly in July and August. Um, what we saw was there was a, a significant amount of winter kill and alfalfa in some regions, and most notably in central and eastern Ontario. Um, we also had a wet spring across most parts of the province, which resulted in late planting. Um, and um, again, followed by a dry summer. Um, so this um, impacted um, some uh, forage crop yields in um, certain areas, most notably in central and eastern Ontario. Um, the exception is northwestern Ontario, where con conditions have been very wet as of August. And um, this has been really impacting uh, pastures. Um, and also making it difficult um, to um, uh, get um, crops off um, to harvest. Um, generally speaking, there's no issues with mycotoxins in corn um, and the wheat crop this year. So the uh, mycotoxin survey results are out for 2019. Um, it's painting a little bit of a different picture than um, the um, what we had last year. So generally speaking, the crop across Ontario is fairly clean. 84% um, of the samples were testing less than 0.5 ppm this year, um, which um, is good. Okay, so um, uh, moving on to um, more eastern parts of, of the country. Um, in the Maritimes, there, uh, again, there was um, some widespread winter kill, um, which impacted both yield and, and quality of forages. Um, there was a cold and wet spring, again, affecting yields. There was some yield recovery, recovery in late May and early June due to some good weather at that time. Um, the pastures, it got 
it got dry in the summer months, so pastures dried up in um, July and August. Um, and then uh, Dorian and um, some other wind and rain events caused some issues with corn, um, particularly lodging was an issue um, and resulted in some crop losses. Okay, so um, so in some parts of uh, eastern Canada, we are looking at, um, in, in some cases, some uh, tight uh, forage supplies. So these are just some, uh, we're limited in, in time here, but these are just some ideas for, um, for stretching forage supplies. So um, uh, reducing waste during storage and feeding is something that we can keep in mind for, for every year. Um, there's some considerations for extended grazing um, options. Um, there are grains and byproducts that can be added to the ration to um, stretch forward supplies. Um, if we're looking at um, uh, salvage corn um, as um, cattle producers, we've got some options in terms of corn um, harvest options for, for uh, feeding cattle. Um, so cob meal, um, high moisture corn and corn silage make um, great feedstuffs for feeding cattle. Um, reducing stress from temperature, wind and moisture can um, reduce energy requirements. And um, it's, it's a um, in the case of tight forage supplies, um, it's a good time to consider some tight calling decisions. Okay, and so just on that note, it's really important to um, be calculating inventory. So if you're going to run out of feed, um, it's better to anticipate that now to um, reduce costs and um, problems um, uh, later on through the winter season, winter feeding period. Um, so you can use your lab results once again to understand your dry matter values, which um, are typically used for formulating rations, um, to um, understand any concerns with toxins and spoilage so that um, uh, feedstuffs um, can be um, blended and um, fed to specific um, classes of cattle accordingly. Um, and um, also so that you can develop strategies for feeding out um, feedstuffs based on quality and um, cattle class. Okay, so just some, to summarize some of the things that uh, Karen and I um, discussed tonight, uh, feed testing plays a critical role in developing an effective feeding program and also to managing input costs. Um, proper sampling, representative sampling and submission techniques um, are really critical for getting accurate results um, and um, informing your feeding program. You can use your um, feed test results and work with a feed advisor to balance your rations, identify potential toxins and deficiencies, um, and as Karen discussed, determine impacts of storage um, and also assess your feed inventories. And um, consider options for stretching feed supplies if there is potential for feed storage. And again, using your feed test results is critical here as well. Okay. Sorry, hang on a second. Yes. Okay, Megan. Okay, so uh, now we will take your questions. So you can enter those at the bottom or the top of your screen. Um, we do have some questions already. So I'll get Karen and Megan to turn your cameras back on and we'll start working through some of the questions. Uh, one of the first ones we have here, if you have some spoilage in your bale, for example, do you include that in your sample? Megan, you're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still having some issues here. Um, yeah, so it depends on um, whether, um, so if you're um, sampling from a bale, for example, if it's the outer layers that have um, spoilage um, and you're going to take that off before feeding the bale, then um, it's not um, uh, necessary to include that as part of the sample. The idea is that you want to take samples that are representative of what you're actually feeding. 
Karen, do you have anything to add to that? No, that's 100% right. I mean, you're the nutritionist here. <laughs> uh, okay, we got a couple of questions around nitrates. So if you have high nitrate levels, um, how to feed those? Uh, so if you got that in a feed test, do you blend it with a low nitrate feed or av avoid feeding the high nitrate levels with a certain production group? Ooh, I know things about nitrates. Okay. Um, so, so a couple of things with nitrates. Um, a, it depends how high those levels are. Uh, B, your pregnant cows are going to be the most susceptible to nitrates, and, and we really want to avoid feeding high levels of nitrates to those pregnant cows. Um, some, some data I've looked at, and, and we'll see if, if Megan, the real nutritionist in the room, agrees, um, but if we're looking at nitrate levels above 4,000 parts per million, do not feed it to anything. Um, if we're looking at lower levels than that, you're gonna really want to limit it in the diet. So you're gonna wanna mix it off to, to 50 or 25% dry on a dry matter basis, depending on what those levels are. Um, and you're going to want to look at if we're in about that 1500 per, per million range, I would say you're, you don't want any more than 50% on a dry matter basis to pregnant cows. Um, does that kind of fit with, with what you think, Megan? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, and then there's a kind of second part to that question. Um, what effects do nitrates have on cattle? And you might have addressed some of that already. Yeah, so nitrates can cause abortions. Um, it can cause some pretty severe health issues in, in those cattle. So we want to be uh, pretty careful about it can cause abortions and death, uh, actually sudden death. So you won't even really notice it until it happens uh, at those really high levels. So we, we want to be pretty careful. Um, are there any special considerations for testing and feeding baleage? Ooh. Did we lose Megan again? I think we may have. Oh. Can you hear me? Can you hear you, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so um, in terms of feeding baleage, um, the same kind of concepts apply where you want to be taking um, multiple core samples from um, different bales to send for submission. Um, because this is a high moisture feed, you do want to make sure that you're maintaining that sample integrity by um, uh, freezing the composite um, before you send away for uh, sample submission. Okay, got lots of questions rolling in here. Um, how important is calcium in a corn grazing diet? Yep, yeah, so um, yeah, that's one, um, uh, that's one mineral that will likely have to be submitted on a, um, corn grazing in a corn grazing scenario. So um, again, uh, what you wanna do is um, uh, test, um, uh, plants where the cattle are grazing, um, understand where your deficiencies are and supplement accordingly, but, but calcium is one, one um, mineral that will have to be supplemented on uh, when grazing um, corn or uh, corn stubble. Okay, well, we had a couple of questions here. Uh, do we have to worry about nitrates in grazing frost killed alfalfa? Legumes uh, don't actually accumulate nitrates in the same way that uh, cereal crops do. So in the frost killed alfalfa, my understanding is, and, and please Megan, correct me if I'm wrong here, you should be okay. Yeah, that's right. I, I agree with you there, Karen. Uh, most of our concerns are in um, annuals um, in terms of nitrates. Okay, and there was another question about annuals. Uh, when would it be safe to graze um, frost, uh, killing frost in annuals? If you can, wait two weeks until after that killing frost. Um, it tends to, the nitrate levels tend to peak about uh, 
anywhere from five days to a week after the frost, especially if it was a heavy frost. But um, then you need to give it a little bit of time for those, those nitrate levels to fall back down. So if at all possible, wait a couple of weeks. Okay. Um, <laughs> you guys can try this one. Do you lose as much vitamin A and other minerals in stored silage as in round bales? Idea? That's a tough question. It is a tough question. Any thoughts on that one, Megan? Yeah, I'm not sure about I'm not sure about that one. I do know that silage tends to act as a bit of a preservative, but I I'd have to double check, but I suspect you'd be better off supplementing. Um, even with silage, but we can uh, do some digging and get back to you through Ellen. Mm -hmm. And I know who this one is from, so we can do that. Oh, that's a good question. How about using the feed test to help improving how you produce your forages or feed? Oh, for sure. So, if I'm understanding the question right, um, the one of the things you can do with those that quality analysis is feed your poor quality feed earlier in gestation and save your good quality stuff for when the nutritional requirements are higher in late gestation and lactation. So you're making the, the best utilization of the feed you have available without compromising any nutritional requirements. Okay, let me just take a couple more questions. Um, I think you guys had mentioned this briefly. Um, uh, this question is, so how often would you say I should feed, be feed testing bales or silage that sits in stores for long periods of time, every six months, every three months, um, how often? I'll defer to Megan on that one. So it depends on, um, it does depend on how um, it's being stored. So um, if it is, um, if your forage is protected from the elements, um, there's um, less um, uh, degradation um, um, in um, protected storage. So um, if your forages are exposed to the elements and are, are protected, there is going to be um, significant dry matter losses and you should be testing more frequently. Okay. What is the size of sample considered to be too large for your feed sample? And, um, yeah, I'm not sure what they mean for submission or for collecting. Uh, so for, for submission, you're looking at submitting a composite sample of around 200 to 500 grams is the target. Perfect. Okay, I think we will stop there with questions. We had some really great questions this evening. Um, so, close this here. So, in closing, uh, there's just a couple more things that I need to let you know about before we go. One is how to get more information and science-based production advice through the BCRC. Uh, you can go to our website, beefresearch.ca, and click the subscribe button to sign up for our free email list or to subscribe for our e-newsletter, The Wire. If you've got a Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube account, you can connect with us there. Our next webinar will be supplementing your cow herd, not cover crops. Uh, we're supplementing your cow herd, managing the pregnant cow for better calf performance. That will be on November 21st at 7 o'clock Mountain Time. Our speakers for this webinar will be Katie Wood from the University of Guelph. You'll receive an email from me in a couple of days with a link to watch the recording of this webinar, as well as links to some additional information on feed testing, on feed testing and stretching your winter feed. Uh, you also receive a link to a survey. If you can take a few minutes of your time to fill this out, it's very helpful for us when preparing the future webinars. And that's it. Thank you to you at home for joining us tonight. And on behalf of everyone, thank you, Karen and Megan, for volunteering your time and expertise.
Good night.